deal to say about this relationship. While emphasizing that, I wanted to stress, as I think we mentioned last time, that having said that, it's not entirely true that God is only interested in what we are inside. While that is his most important uh, his greatest desire for us is that we be like Jesus inside. That's not his only desire for us. We, it's not enough for us to cultivate the inner man. It's not enough for us to try to be what God wants us to be. Alone. While that's the most important thing, it's impossible to be anything without acting, without living, without doing. And there's a very fine balance that God re requires us to work out in our individual lives between being something on the inside and doing and acting on the outside. What's the definition of an atom bomb? Well, I'm, I can't give you a technical definition. All I know is that an atom bomb is a mechanical device made by man that and and yet that isn't merely a, a good definition of an atom bomb that's what it is it's a mechanical device made by man that doesn't tell you anything about an atom bomb i mean so is a pencil a mechanical device that's made by man or a pen right what really gives you a definition of an atom bomb is what it can do an atom bomb is a mechanical device made by a man that is capable of unbelievable havoc when it detonates. Now you're talking about action there, you see. And when we give definitions of things, when we talk about essence, when we talk about being, even in life, we never naturally separate between being and doing. It's impossible for a Christian to, for a person to be a Christian without really changing at all. And God gives us severe warnings in the Word of God, lest we profess to be, and there is no corresponding change. This morning in 1 John, I would like to focus our attention on this subject, on the lies we live with. The lies we live with. This book, a short book in the Bible, is addressed to Christians. And each one of us is a complex individual that is and are walking contradictions. We are a number of things and we act a number of different ways. What we say very often does not match up with what we do. And I would like to focus our attention on four characteristics that I suppose each one of us have failed in at one time or other or are now struggling with. And it all has to do with this fundamental issue of balancing out being and doing. We must not forget that as we go through this. What we're not talking about is just conforming our outward behavior so that it pleases Steve Clock or the elders of the church or or to our norm, our social norm as Christians of uh, what, uh, what is and what is not acceptable behavior. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about actions and, and lifestyle this morning and specific issues of activity that we must question whether or not are being balanced out with what we really are inside. Every one of us goes through each day giving impressions of ourselves to other people. When we get up in the morning, we many of us don't really worry about the impression that we give to the person we live with because they know us too well. We can't put anything over on them, and so we go walking around the house in our, you know, in what we would die be, it wouldn't, it would kill us to be seen in public, but uh, we walk around showing what we're really like to the people we're closest to. But, you know, as soon as somebody comes to the door, we go into a dither, you know, to try to change uh, the impression, right? Or somebody, uh, you know, you're in the midst of an argument and the telephone rings and you're, 
you, you know, somebody that you respect is on the line. Oh, hello, how are you? You know, we're fine. You know, um, in a large measure, this is nothing but profession. This is what we are professing to be. We're giving an impression. We are saying, this is how I am. I am this way. I am such and such a person. And this is profession. And we say this in a number of different ways, from just the nuances of, of unspoken behavior to the actual words we say, to the way we talk about other people, to the way we refer to ourselves. And just the multitude of different ways we say, we make professions. But how about our real lives? How about the 99% of the time when other people aren't necessarily watching? When, when we are what we are and we do what we do and we don't think anybody else is watching us and we think what we think. You see. Um, even thoughts in, 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 in a large measure are deeds. You know, God's going to judge us for those things that we've thought. And... Um, we have this struggle, like, uh, as well demonstrated by the little kid uh, who was told by his daddy to do something, and, and uh, he didn't want to do it. He argued with his daddy, and his daddy gave him a licking. So the next time his daddy asked him to do something, uh, he, uh, he argued with himself, and finally he decided, well, for his own safety's sake, he'd better do it, right? And so in doing it, uh, on the way out the door, he said, well, I may be standing up, uh, uh, sitting, see, I, <laughs> how, does, how come I do this, Paul? I may be um, standing up on the outside, but I'm sitting down on the inside. <laughs> right. And how often we do this as Christians. We live with lies, and we don't seem to let it bother us. We, we live with one kind of profession, and we, and our actions and our lifestyle completely contradict, and we get used to that. And, and we get, and, and if anybody ever uh, dares approach this, uh, the, this difference in our lives, the first thing we do is get defensive and say, well, what about you? You know, I can look at you, <laughs> you know, and I can talk about your faults. Right? Well, I'm not going to talk about any one of you in particular this morning. The Word of God has a great deal to say, and I hope that you will internalize it yourself, that you will seriously consider whether or not you are demonstrating any one of these earmarks yourselves. Are you living with a lie in your life? You know, it's, it's a pretty sober thing. It, it would be a little shocking for me to stand up here and, and say, you're a bunch of liars this morning. I mean, when, you, when a person makes a statement like that, you've got to have pretty good basis for saying such a thing. But I can guarantee you that I'm not entirely wrong if I was to say such a thing this morning based on the Word of God. And I have to admit that I, have to, I would fall into that category myself. Right. But having said that, let's not just uh, water it down and say, well, it doesn't matter what this guy is going to say this morning. You know, I can look around and look at all the other people and say, well, this person is a liar and that person is a liar and this fits them and, uh, boy, I wish they could see what they're really like. Let's talk about ourselves this morning. Okay. Let's talk about ourselves. This little book, has a number of themes, but two we want to look at. And they both uh, are emphasized in the first chapter of this book. Remembering that John is writing to Christians, the first theme that he emphasizes is profession. Seven times profession is mentioned in this book. In verse 6, if we say. Verse 8, if we say. Verse 10, if we say. Chapter 2, verse 4, he that saith. Chapter 2, verse 6, he that saith. Chapter 2, verse 9, he that saith. Chapter 4, verse, nine, verse 20, if a man says. Right? There are seven repeated instances of direct reference to profession in this book. And remember, we're not talking about unsaved people. We're talking about God's own children. This is what this book is written to. If a man says. The other thing that John talks about equally much in this book is lying lying. Now, most of us who call ourselves Christians don't really think we're liars. We just, you know, it doesn't have, we've kind of dealt with that in the past, if we had a problem with it, hopefully. And, and we don't consider ourselves to be liars, but taking the standards of God's Word and what it says here, there's some very sobering things to consider. 
Seven times in this book, John talks about liars or lying. And four of these instances, in both cases, he weds the two together. Four instances he connects profession to lying. And the four instances are in verse, and we're going to look at these in turn this morning. First John chapter 1, verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. In chapter 1, verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. That's God. We make God a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And over in chapter 4, verse 20, If a man says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? I want to go back over these four familiar passages and look at the characteristics or the earmarks of a liar. Or we could look at, the, call them lies that we live with. And Christians live with these things. And that's why I believe that it's in God's Word. That's why this book was written in part. To show us what's wrong with us. And to show us that we're not just so hot shot good to begin with. You know, we're still sinners and we've got a lot of working to do in our lives. And, and we can never get to the point where we can say um, that somebody else's problems are an excuse for ours. Or that, well, we've arrived. You see, we've got to be careful. So let's go back over these. First John chapter 1, verse 6. The first year mark of a liar is that his lifestyle contradicts his profession of fellowship with God. The first instance Paul, that John speaks of this, he says, if we say, and it's in the plural, uh, the common problem here, if we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say that we have fellowship with him, what kind of a profession is this? What if? What is fellowship? Let's think about that for a moment. What is fellowship? Well, when I think of fellowship, I think of sharing. I, I think of being on intimate terms with another person. I think of knowing a person well, being able to communicate, considering that person my friend and that person considering me his or her friend. Fellowship. Uh, nothing uh, that prevents uh, closeness. Nothing blocking that kind of a relationship. Now, every one of us in this, in this room this morning, I hope, is a Christian. And if you were to take a poll of the average Christian in the average church on, in the average Sunday morning and say, are you in fellowship with God? Do you, have, do you think that you're walking in fellowship with God? I would say most of us would say yes. How much sin does it take to break fellowship with God? How big of a sin does it take to break fellowship with God? How open a sin does it take to break fellowship with God? How continuous a sin does it take to break fellowship with God? When you begin to answer those questions, it begins to be much clearer that most of us aren't in fellowship with God most of the time. If we say, in the present tense, we have continual fellowship with Him, but we walk in darkness, we lie. It's one thing to profess to be on intimate terms with God, but continually walking in darkness. And I, I in passing, before we leave this particular one, I just want to, to mention here, it is very important here, because a lot of people misinterpret this particular verse of Scripture. It doesn't say, if we... Um, Say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we lose our salvation. He's not talking about salvation here, he's talking about fellowship. There's a vast difference. Right. Um, growing up in our family, I am a son. I have been a son, I continue to be a son. And I have never ever done anything yet that caused me not to be a son. I've always been a son, but there have been many times when I was out of fellowship with my father. 
and uh, that's the parallel. Okay, John is not talking about salvation; he's talking about fellowship. If we th if we say that we have an intimate relationship with the Lord, um, that things are going well, but we're walking in darkness. If we're walking about in darkness, if we are sinning, and we have a very light view of our sin, if we if if we are oblivious to what we're doing wrong, <laughs> we're liars. We're liars. We do not the truth. The contrast here is in verse 7. If, But, in contrast, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, that's an interesting final phrase that he adds in that verse, that even when we are walking in fellowship, the blood of Jesus Christ has to be w cleansing us from our sin, because the Lord knows that an absolutely sinless, perfect Christian walk is impossible for us down here. We still have our vile bodies. You see, right? But so what John is talking about is a, is a, is a major lifestyle, the, the general practice of a Christian walking in the light. Do we generally walk in the light? Or are, is it such an intermittent thing or very infrequent? We, we just can't say that we have fellowship, continual fellowship with the Lord if we do not have a continual, proper walk with the Lord. And, and of course, the one thing that, that you know best in your life or things that is preventing fellowship, we call habits. I'm not going to make a list of them this morning. You know what your habits are. I know what mine are. Could be anything from visible things to invisible things in our lives. But habits happen to be things that we continually practice. And if it's sin, it's breaking our fellowship that much more with the Lord. And if we are practicing sinful habits, whether it be mental thoughts or deeds that we know are wrong, that we are convinced of are wrong, then, then we, we just can't say we're in fellowship with the Lord on a regular basis. And yet, a lot of times we leave the impression we make the profession. We let other people think from the way we talk and the terminology we use and the, the, the tone of voice and the expression on our face and things that things are A1 between us and God. We wouldn't dare leave any other impression that things are going well. And to that extent, we are liars. And I know a lot of Christian liars. You don't have to say it. You don't have to go up and knock on their door and say, you're a liar. But uh, people, once we begin to know one another, we begin to recognize uh, the things that don't add up. Here's a contradiction. Here's, the ear, here's one earmark of a liar. A Christian that says they are in frequent, continuous fellowship with the Lord, and yet they're not dealing with habits of sin in their lives. They're walking in darkness. The Word of God says that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. John chapter 11, verse 10, if we walk in the light, in the... If a man walk in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. You're either, you're either in the light or in, you're in the darkness. Um, all of us have grown up with this throughout our lifetime. Um, you go out at nighttime and you can tell whether there's any light or not. Right? If the stars are shining, there's light. Right? If the glow from the city is illuminating our area, there's light. It might not be very much, but it's still light. But when you're in darkness, you know you're in darkness because there is no light and you can't see anything. See, it's black and white. It's one or the other. See? And uh, our responsibility as Christians is to deal with the sin, which is the night or the darkness in our lives, to get rid of that by choice and deal with it so that we can get back in fellowship with the Lord. And that is why... Uh, we have the wonderful verse here in this chapter to confess our sins and the Lord faithfully and righteously restores us. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 3 to 15 has a great deal to say about this and I'll leave that one with you to read on your own about walking as children of light. So one of the earmarks of being a liar is having a lifestyle that contradicts the impression or the profession that we make or give about being in a walk with the Lord is pleasing. Now just skip down a couple of verses and look at the last three verses of the chapter. John gives us another test, another description, another earmark of being a liar. 
And that is that it's very possible for a Christian's profession to reveal a callous insensitivity to our own sinfulness. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Skipping verse 9 for the moment. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. These two examples are somewhat different, but they're closely related, and so we'll join them for our, for our observations. There's really two kinds of profession here. I haven't met too many people of either one, but I know what happens, even on a little scale, because uh, it can happen for a few hours in our lives, or a few days, or a few weeks. Uh, we may not ever express it publicly to anybody else, but to ourselves, we're, we're saying, I'm not wrong, I'm right. right? Or, nothing wrong with me. See? Or we're unwilling to say, well, maybe I am wrong. We're unwilling to really search out what the Word of God says about our actions to see if they are sin, just in case we might discover that it is sin, and we've been wrong all along. Okay, there's two different cases here. First of all, is the present tense. If a person says that he has no sin, and this is the present tense, I haven't got any sin. Have you ever done that? Have you ever met anybody? It, infrequently in our circles of fellowship, we don't, we meet people like this. Occasionally, I have met a couple of people that really believed that they had no sin. They had finally attained. They finally did uh, gained victory over their sinful nature so that they, were, they, uh, they attained absolute, sinless, ultimate sanctification that they had just achieved. They were walking perfect now. See? Now, none of us really goes to that extreme, I don't think. But as I mentioned, it's very easy for us to convince ourselves for a short period of time that something we're doing that maybe we've never really checked ourselves out right, is sin. And we're not willing to say it is. And and uh, and and that and we're unwilling to say, well, I'm, it's wrong. If we say that we do not have sin, we deceive ourselves. We lead ourselves down the path. That's literally what it means. We lead ourselves astray, and the truth is not in us. You notice that frequently, in talking about these tests or the earmarks of being spiritual liars, John brings in the thing that makes the difference the answer, the solution, and that is the truth. This here, this standard, this book, this revelation of God is clearly the one and the only way to, for us to identify our problems and to deal with it. The truth. The Word of God is like a light. It claims to be a lamp to our feet and a, feet and a light to our path, and it shows us the way. It reproves us, it corrects us, it instructs us in the way to go. And that's why it's profitable. And so the first profession that a Christian can make is, is that he has uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with him, <laughs> when in fact there probably is. The second one in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, and you notice the tense changes, the verb changes, it's not the same, it's not talking about the present, thing. it's in the past. If we say that we haven't sinned, we make God a liar, because God says we have. For all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 9 and 10, Paul says, We have before proved, both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's, those are God's words. God says that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. It doesn't matter if, if you're just the average Christian or a spiritual leader. We've all done this. We're all sinners. We have, we have made mistakes. If we say that we have not sinned, if we've not done anything wrong, we make God a liar because he said we have. It's that simple. The problem is, is that every one of us is finite, fallible creatures. We have not yet attained, and we never will down here until God changes our nature, until he takes what is wrong with us out of us <laughs> and gives us a new body and a new mind. See, and he's going to do that someday, and I'm looking forward to that. Because I get awful tired of living with this vile creature that lives inside of me sometimes. Right. In fact, that's the way it's described in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21 says, 
Christ shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Right? So God says we have sinned. God says our bodies are desperately wicked. Our hearts are desperately deceitful. And we can't even know the, the depths of, the, of, of what is wrong with us. We're so easily self-deceived. We don't understand everything we've done ourselves. And we certainly can't say we understand what everybody else does. And let us be very careful to say that we, we're right, absolutely right. And the other person is absolutely wrong. And let us be very careful to say that we never have made a mistake in some particular area. Right? Let's be careful. Because when we do that, um, it's very possible for us to deceive ourselves or even to make God a liar. And how, God forbid that we would do that. A third year mark of a liar is a Christian who professes to be growing in the knowledge of the Lord but lives a disobedient life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. I'll start reading verse 3. By this we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, and here's the profession part, here's the outward, the impression that we leave. He that says, oh, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. You know, God is very blunt. Aren't you glad? He doesn't leave us in any state of confusion about our walk and our talk and our relationship with him. He says that if the condition isn't fulfilled, then you're out of it. <laughs> you know, and so am I. See? And we've just got to be very careful. You know, Paul, uh, John's choice of terms here is very significant. I want to focus on that for a moment. A person that says, I know him. And there is a number of verbs for know in the New Testament. And this one is gnosko. Present tense, which means, um, ginosko is the verb to mean to get to know by experience. The a process of adding knowledge piecemeal, a piece at a time, gaining by experience. That's what ginosko means. Oida means to grab the whole thing, get the whole idea. Intuitive, general, I got, I got it. There's a big difference between saying, I know the Lord, that is, know everything about him. That isn't what John is saying here. He's using the term ginosko. He that saith, I am gaining in my continuous appreciation and knowledge of who God is and what he is like. He that says, I know him, present tense, I am continuing to know him. I am continuing on in this process of get, getting to know the Lord better and better and more and more, but doesn't obey the word of God as a liar. You cannot be in a process of attaining and appropriating knowledge of who God is really like and be in disobedient to his word because as soon as you turn around and disobey his word, he goes chop and shuts the door for the funnel into our brains <laughs> because he isn't going to give us any more knowledge. As soon as we turn away from his word and disobey, it shuts. It just doesn't work. The process stops completely dead. When we're out of fellowship with the Lord, that process of getting to know him stops. Now, the word that John uses here for keep is not fulasso. Fulasso is, uh, is a word that's used for guarding and keeping the prisoners in jail, in chains. You keep them in jail. Right? Well, this word that John uses is tereo. It means uh, to watch, to give heed to, to observe, to keep your eye on, in other words. To be very familiar in the sense of uh, it's, in, it's in your mind, it's in your sight. You're, you're watchfully guarding it with your understanding, with your thoughts. Is, have you ever heard, heard the expression, out of mind, out of sight? Or out of sight, out of mind? It usually goes together. As soon as we are out of sight of, of some people, then uh, we, don't, we forget about what is important to them kids especially you know as soon as they're out of sight of mommy and daddy well you know they forget everything that mommy and daddy ever taught them you'd think right right and so they they lie and they fight and they cheat and they steal and they and they do everything but as soon as mommy and daddy comes oh yeah i remember i'm not supposed to do that See? okay well this is the idea that john is talking about here 
keeping not God's commandments means letting them fly right out of your thinking. As soon as my thoughts supplant God's thoughts, and they're not the same, by the way, as soon as his thoughts leave my attention, then I am open to, to violating them and, and, uh, and thereby stopping being arrested in my appropriation of the knowledge of God. That is why Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.14, keep this commandment, guard it, keep it in your mind without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is something that's a struggle. It's not easy to keep thinking about the things that you're supposed to think about, to be continuously mindful of the Word of God and its principles. It's hard to do that. It really is. But as soon as we don't, then we're not growing in the knowledge of the Lord. We can't make that claim. We can't make that profession. And if we do, we're a liar. It's that simple. Now, I've met people that said, uh, you know, uh, things are going good. I'm beginning to understand more and more. You know, things are starting to fall together. But they're doing things wrong. And I, that, that doesn't make sense. We have a contradiction here. God says, that person is a liar. And the truth is not in us. All right, there's one last one that I want to focus our attention on, and that is over in chapter 4, verse 20. 1 John, chapter 4, verse 20. This verse is not isolated. It does not just appear in this particular chapter all of a sudden. Because in chapter 3 and chapter 4 and on into chapter 5, John has been talking about this subject of loving God and loving the brethren. About 10 times in these two chapters, it comes right from chapter 3, verse 16. By this we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What kind of an attitude does that show you? It, it ought to show you the same kind of attitude that God had. We ought to have. Right? We're undeserving for, of God's great love. There's lots of things that God could have used as excuses not to love us. Right? Not to do things for us. Not to give us his son. All kinds of problems we have. But he did it anyway. And so... That parallel is tied to our responsibility. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's the kind of attitude that we're talking about when we talk about loving the brethren and loving God. We have it in chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. In verse 8 again, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Okay? Man's description compared to God's character. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, there's the heavenly example, the human is, we ought also to love one another. In the middle of verse 12, if we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Verse 16, the middle of the verse, God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. Right? Dwelling in love is, is our experience down here. And then, verse 20, John puts it in the familiar test form for us to evaluate. Here is a fourth earmark of a liar. If a man says, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. It's black and white again. And he explains, For he that does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is his commandment that we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. The profession here is a person that says that they love the Lord. That has almost become an empty cliche today. We all use it at one time or another. I love the Lord. Do you really love the Lord? Do I really love the Lord? What does loving the Lord mean? What is the loving the Lord characterized by? 
Well, if you really want to know what it means for us to love the Lord, just look at His love for us. It was sacrificial. It was complete dedication, complete devotedness. That's what agapao, the Greek verb for love, means. It means a committedness, total devotion for the welfare and benefit of others. And Paul continu John continues on here, and he uses that same term, and he says, now that kind of agapao love is what you are to demonstrate to others. Total committedness. Total devotedness. And a person that says that they love God, they are totally committed to God, totally devoted to Him, but do not extend that privilege and that right and that responsibility to other Christians is just doing something wrong. It doesn't match up. I've got to have the same forbearant attitude towards my brothers as God has toward me. Absolutely important. There's two sides to this question that we must forget, we must not forget. Look at the first two verses of the next chapter. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. What uh, John is first talking about here is that if we love God, we'll love the brethren. That's one way to put it. If we really love God, we're going to demonstrate that by our attitudes towards every Christian brother, no matter how weak, how sinful, how failing. If we love God, we're going to demonstrate the same attitude that he had toward us to them. Now, turning it around in the next verse, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. This is what many people often forget. It's so easy for us to point our finger at others and say, you're not loving me. You're not demonstrating the right attitude. And yet, maybe they are. Maybe we just don't understand what they're doing. This verse says that if we love the brethren, we will love God. And how do we love God? By keeping His commandments. You can't expect another person to love you and to do something wrong. Just because you might get offended if they do something right. And there's two sides. If we love the brethren, we'll love the Lord. And if we love God, we'll love the brethren. And there's different kinds of responsibility attached to each one of those. You see. And a person can't say that he loves the Lord and is unwilling to love his brethren. And that means not only an attitude, but the willingness to shoulder the responsibility to correct, to show the truth, to show the way, to, to lead in righteousness, keeping the commandments, making sure other people do too. You remember, it's this, we, this takes us right back to John chapter 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments, you've got to know them, and keep them, you've got to obey them. He it is that loveth me. You see, scriptures do not say that love is merely a proper attitude towards others. True Christian agapao love, as was Christ's own love, was explicit continual dependence and devotedness to God's will. And when I am unwilling to obey the word, I am not loving. And when another person who is obeying the word is, is doing that for my benefit, I, I should be very careful to misinterpret that as a lack of love. See, it, it happens. So here are four characteristics of liars. And God forbid that we as his children would be this. Uh, if we find ourselves lacking in any of these areas, may we decide this morning, here and now, in the quietness of our own hearts, to deal with this, to work at it a little harder. Right? Am I contradicting my profession by habitual sin? Am I contradicting my profession by uh, by insensitivity to my own sin? Am I contradicting my profession of knowing the Lord by disobeying His Word? Am I contradicting my profession by a wrong attitude 
or disobedience to the Word of God. These are things that are worth meditating on, especially when we remember that what Jesus said about the devil, John chapter 8, verse 44. He is the father of lies. He is a liar, and he is the father of it. And uh, we're not demonstrating godliness when we're lying. We're demonstrating something else. And uh, we have just got to deal with these kinds of things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are more concerned with our character, with what we are like inside, our thought patterns, our values, our outlook. We thank you, Father, that you are yourself infinitely perfect in every respect which you require of us. We, we pray, Father, that you will impress upon us a twofold motivation in these coming days, and that is, first of all, to to make sure we do things for the right reasons, that we are not trying to impress people uh, as the Pharisees of old did with deeds without any concern for that which is really true, the, the inner spiritual life. But secondly, that you would help us to, uh, to work at, at our actions as well that, and bring them in conformity to the profession of what we say we are inside. And, uh, and Father, may we each one be drawn closer to you and we know that in the process we'll be drawn closer to one another. And we need this fellowship, Lord, and we covet it. We pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us, each one, to work harder at these things in Jesus' name.